Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Thank you, Yanis, for such a push introduction. Yes, I, 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 I did it uh, very <laughs> passionately. I will turn on the presentation if you will allow yeah. me. So hi, guys. Before I start, because I have a, just a few slides and 25 minutes before you go to lunch, just to understand, are you more of a business audience or OK, a techie audience? <laughs> mix and mix, 50 <laughs> All right, then I'll, I'll try to mix in between, but uh, let's see, uh, I can adapt. Um, well, first of all, no. First of all, it's about the topic. It's a great expectations of a PSD2. It's more or less what we, uh, and when I say we, I don't say bank, a sweat bank, uh, the orange bank expected from PSD2. It's rather, since I've worked for, the, uh, for this bank for quite some time, so I have uh, quite a lot of peers in the market, and. We all had some sort of expectations when PSD2 appeared and I will try to guide you through the expectations and what we see today and what we think about the future. When I say we, besides my peers and there will be actually, actually there will be Alexeus in the afternoon, he's sitting right there from Neo Finance, so he will talk about pretty much the same topic. He is from the other side of the Chinese wall, so he's the one who's consuming the APIs. It will be interesting to hear him. We have not synchronized the messages, so if you will be in both presentations, you can compare and then later and praise someone. When I say we, when I talk about Swedbank, I'm talking about uh, basically a fairly compact uh, two teams. Uh, one team is producing APIs that you guys, most of you are consuming. Another team is actually consuming APIs that other banks are producing, either directly or through the uh, aggregators. And we're servicing, and my presentation will not be only about Latvia, it will be uh, Baltics, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and a little bit of a Sweden. All right, so PSD2 API, what we thought and how we saw when the directive appeared, how we understood it has been designed. At least in my books, there were two key concepts. There was a sort of a long-term relations between TPP or a merchant and the customer. And there, there are sort of many proofs, uh, basically. You can see that uh, up to 90 days uh, consent uh, vali validity period, how the whole consent actually is built, or if you think about how the RTS is written about the customer flows in the RTS. So when, at least how we read it and how we understood it, that RTS has been designed more of a for a long-term relationships between TPP, so onboarding customer and holding the customer and servicing the customer. So rather classical internet bank or a mobile app relation. On the other hand, if we talk about relations, uh, it was about, it, it was very liberal between TPP and the banks. Because if before that in all the history you wanted to cooperate with a bank, you basically needed a contract. In PSD2, the first time it was introduced a uh, license. So basically, oh, sorry, license and certificate. So basically right now, if bank sees a player with a certificate, it just allows uh, the access to the infrastructure. And this sort of this contractless concept, which has its ups and downs, and I think I will, will work on it in quite a lot, but I think it's about two key relationships that we have seen designed in, in RTS in its current version. Longer term with the customer in TPP and the shorter or more liberal between uh, TPP and the bank. And uh, the whole implementation, so how we were implementing it. Uh, I've been also with the bank for quite some time and I basically would say that it's been a very iterative process. Uh, I, I participated in the previous uh, also implementations. For example, Euro, it was not that iterative. It was not changing that often because if you think about European Banking Authority, if some of you have been following it and basically almost on a weekly basis, European Banking Authority for the past year, year and a half, have been um, issuing their opinion on how to interpret the RTS, the technical standard. And I can say there have been quite several uh, turnarounds in our development and fairly major turnarounds. One of the examples is uh, so-called Prieta. Uh, have, many of you have heard about Prieta. Some. 
Pretty, it's the, it, it's, it has been designed as a commercial product, commercial registry, uh, machine readable registry of TPPs. So the bank could basically access the Preta, uh, verify if this TPP have all needed preconditions to uh, provide access to the API and provide it. And that was for us until sometime in the beginning of, of last year. It's been for us the focal point of the process. So we've been, we've, we, we have designed our process to actually to, to rely on Preta data because, uh, because we thought that certificate is not enough. Because certificate says that you, you have a certificate to operate, but you, it's not clear whether Dennis and a Latvian supervisor have actually allowed you to operate in Latvia. And it's still not within certificate. So today we're sort of providing a service to the European players. And we're not 100% sure if they are licensed to operate in Latvia. They're licensed to operate in Europe, but there is a process called passporting. And it's not part of a certificate. And there's been very clear EBA clarification. Banks, don't, you should not care about it. That's the responsibility of a TPP to be fully compliant. You just, if you have certificate, open it up. So that was sort of a, just an example of uh, how the uh, mindset or how the, the, um, the design of our API have been changing every, not every week, but actually fairly, fairly frequently. Then since we've been developing a product for uh, four markets, we've been meeting with the four uh, regulators, national competent authorities, FSAs, whatever name you call them. Um, and it's interesting as well, because the directive is actually European, but still uh, there are some local flavors, some local market uh, standards, for example, in Latvia, I think that the FSA had a quite, and I think it's fairly reasonable opinion that uh, redirect, all of you are still following what I'm saying, the redirect approach, the bank link approach of uh, using the API is good enough because that's sort of a market practice. While in Sweden, it's been clearly no, no, the, you should have a decoupled. Uh, so I will not stop here on explaining what's decoupled and redirect if you're, you're not following, but basically we've had even uh, the interpretation or the market practice a little bit different. So to implement it in the one product, um, it was, well, with the redirect and the decoupled, it was, well, fairly easy. Then we said, okay, we need to develop both. But in some cases you had to choose to do this or that. And then you had to be creative because if you have a clear message from one of the say that they expect this and from another of say that they have that, yeah, so that was another thing. Another, um, yeah, then basically uh, the, uh, the law has been adapted. So you have a Latvian version of payment uh, directive. You have Lithuanian version of payment directive. And they all have those tiny bits and pieces. So for example, in Lithuania, in the API, we have one more additional step, which was required by the local regulator. And that's been translated into the law. So that's a little bit also about uh, and then that also resulted in a fairly different fallback exemption practices. I don't know again about how many guys of you know what the fallback is, but yeah, some people are noting. So the, with the fallback exceptions as well, we've actually produced, I think that we've, we've spent almost three months in documenting what we have produced. It's been that, what, that really heavy document. It's been submitted to all four regulators. Um, in terms of a scope of a service that we have delivered, now I will not just to somehow, to be politically correct, I will not say which regulator acted how, but in some cases, regulators will really, really deep into the details. So it seems that they were actually reading stuff. Uh, in some cases, they were not reading. And for example, in Sweden, we still don't know, they have not answered us. So more or less, we already, what now, four, three, four months after the PSD deadline, we still don't know. And none of the banks in Sweden actually know if they have a fallback exemption or no. So it's neither yes or no. Yeah, so this is just now me bragging how it was difficult to, to work in this environment. But now nine months, more than nine months actually on air, and we have three key figures, one mil, 10,000 and zero. So what is one mil? 
One meal is the usual suspects, the payment initiation services. So it's uh, Alexeus with Neo Finance, there are guys with uh, Pacer, and there are a couple of other payment service providers who were using previously Banklink, and they just switched from a Banklink to API. So this is why sort of I have this picture. So basically, if we're using a horses, then we just basically we replace the horse with the vehicle, and but it was, it's still the carriage. So, but this is like most of the use cases right now. So this is one million of uh, uh, transactions. This is what we managed to process until the uh, mm, new year last year. So since launch until the new year, account information services. Which basically, if you think about where I started, I started right here and saying that they we're talking about long-term relations. Those long-term relations are built for account information services, where, you're, where you don't need to log in for a 90 days. And today we have 10,000 uh, users who are using that particular service. And um, well, it's incomparable with the amount of uh, users of a payment service, uh, payment service providers. And confirmation of funds that a third uh, API that has been actually designed to challenge point of sales and cards uh, schemas currently is not used in none of the geographies that we're operating and not and to my knowledge also nowhere in Europe, at least to my knowledge. Um, there are some other things which may be also worth mentioning is that um, we have a lot of differences in PSD2 API standards. Uh, we, as a bank, we followed Berlin Group specification. There is a French stat, there is Open Bank in UK, Polish API, Slovak API, and there are other actual standards. Uh, but even if you think that there is a common standard, uh, banks in our market, so just again, to be politically correct, and I'm not blaming here, neither bank A or bank B and bank C, I'm just showing the differences. That for example, if you want to get an account statement from bank A, you just have one call and you get the full account statement. From bank B, you make a call, you receive a file which you need to parse and you have account statement. From bank C, you get a high level account statement without the details and for each and every transaction, you need to make a separate call. So basically you have an account statement with a thousand transactions, you need to make 1001 call to have the full details. And all of these guys are following Berlin Group specification. So I'm not blaming them. It's most likely they have their own reasons. But I'm sort of a trying to understand how painful it is for you and for us because we're also com consuming those APIs is actually to, 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 to do that. Another example is the uh, number of calls to get account balance. And yes, it's also a fairly simple example. In one, in, in one bank A, you can get it through one call. In bank B, you can need it for all accounts. And in bank B, you need to have one call per each account. So if it's a corporate customer with the 30, 40 accounts, then basically you have 40 calls, which is maybe not that big difference between as with bank C in this case. And I can say that we have not actually, and I don't think that market actually have felt yet the pain with the contractless, con uh, with the contractless concept introduction. And I want to stop here a little bit because contractless will be painful from two perspectives, from certificates perspective. So I don't know how many of you have operations. So you worked in uh, Estonia, but if you have worked in Estonia and you have, you managed to actually, you, you had the interaction with the, uh, qualified certificates there, then you understand what I'm talking about. Because I think that I'm at least, I feel super lucky working in a bank that have operations and huge operations in Estonia. Because we, for 10 years, we have been working quite a lot with exactly this public uh, certificate infrastructure. This is super complicado. To do it once, to implement a new certificate and feed it to someone, that's easy. But then when you need to start playing, renewing certificates, I can tell you today one example. We have uh, onboarded right now, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 TPPs across the Europe that are either using our API or going to be using our API. And what we're doing, we're calling the, for qualified certificates, there are trust service providers who are providing that. And those could be anyone around the Europe. And uh, 
Now again, I will be politically correct. So what we're doing, we're actually sending each 10 minutes, we're just sending to the service provider uh, check if this certificate is still valid once we onboarded the certificate. From some southern countries, then can be a silence for four or five hours. So basically you're sending a request if, uh, if this certificate is still valid and they're not responding at all. It's not a problem because still the certificate we received, so it should be valid according to the contract for 24 hours, that's fine. But what we learned also working in Estonia, if such things happening with your provider, most likely the service level there is uh, not so good. So basically once we will start growing a scale on this thingy, and if there will be a high, high level, a high load uh, uh, on the whole schema, I think that we can feel the pain from a certificates point of view in terms of availability, uh, in terms of uh, multiple certificates that will be outdated, invalidated, handling them and managing them. Uh, and also from a security point of view, storing them and then later on auditing how you store them, etc., etc. Another thing, another cool thing from a contractless, it's from a customer perspective, it's the claim. So let's say if you're a customer, something, ha something bad happened with a transaction that you initiated through the TPP and your bank, well, your money is in a bank, but you have a TPP. And then you need to figure out where, uh, what, what's wrong happened. So you go to the TPP, then most likely they point finger to a bank. You go to a bank, most likely, well, bank needs to respond, so they will respond. But then an investigation later will be also fairly interesting because the bank, since there is no contract, then they will need to find, basically Google a contacts of a TPP that is sitting somewhere in Spain, call them, and say, guys, we have a claim from uh, Yanis. And uh, you know, just the process itself, let's say, will be awkward. At some point of a bank, at some point of a time, some banks can st start pointing fingers back. So basically, this is another thing that clearly will need to be solved, the claim management process. And this is what I was more or less reflecting to the uh, Dennis presentation, because this is what the key value in the card schema that you have all the processes solved. You need to charge back, pff, done. You have a claim, clear process, done. So this is something where payments uh, infra right now, it's uh, fairly fresh. So I think that if uh, there is something regulators can do and the market can do is exactly point out, point out those uh, missing components and work on those. We did the same thing with the smart ID because we believe that we understood that instant payments are coming, alias are coming, and we understood that there, then there's a need for good authentication. So this is why we started to act on the smart ID two, three years ago. Yeah, but that's not PSD2. And two minutes. Okay, a little bit of statistics. So as I mentioned, number of executed payments, so they all sum up uh, to one mil. I, I, for January, I don't have data here, but it will be somewhere around here. It's just because people are buying a little bit less in January than in December usually. So that's the key reason why we have, but it, I would say still, it's a fairly steady grow. Amount of money they are transferring through the API, so you can see it's somewhere between 70 and 110. So it's around 800 euros. Uh, type of executed payments by type, domestic and foreign. Then you sorry, they, they should have be also instant payments, but they're just not visible yet. And the usage of APIs, basic endpoints. We're talking basically payments, payments, and a little bit of accounts. But that's more or less you can see from the previous statistics. Future guesswork. So obviously the next version of regulatory technical standard should build in the short-term relations. This is what we have, this is what I've started with, that we, it's been built for a long-term relations. Right now we have a guys that are having a business in the short-term relations and it's not built in. And this is where we have attention. This is where we're meeting TPPs. We're trying to make life easier for TPPs. And this is where we think, all, because for us, making life easier for TPPs, actually it's a good thing because eventually this is what we see for us as a business model, because if they grow, then most likely they will become our partners. Their appetite will grow for 
additional value added services. Another thing which is very clear, and I think I also, Dennis also pointed a little bit on that, it's the ML KYC responsibilities. Right now, everybody is on ML and KYC. So TPPs will receive some obligations to, um, but it's most likely will not be a regulatory technical standard, or it will be just some reference, but most likely it will be like national ML laws or something like that. It's painful. This is actually one of interesting things. We had, uh, I think, five, six uh, open banking events since launch of the PSD2 API in all markets, Sweden, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. In all the events, the people just were raising their hands and saying, all right, integrating with your API, it's like just, okay, we don't even talk about it. That's like nothing. But we have a problem with getting a license. We have, we're spending so much time on legal. We're spending more money on legal that we're spending more than we're spending on a business development. This is what actually uh, regular fintechs or TPPs uh, feedback was. And it seems that with this, it will be a little bit more. So basically, you're we are all stepping in into regu regulated market and it will be a fairly interesting development. And hopefully, the situation that I've been showing right here with the different implementations, even within the same standard, we see that even with the next version of a Berlin group specification, it will become more stricter. Because right now we're sort of, a, everybody's playing uh, ice hockey, uh, all Europe. But some guys are playing with a ball, and other guys are playing with a, what is it, poke. Somebody is uh, playing with, uh, with a really wide gate. Somebody is playing with, the sh I don't know, gates or what is the name for those. So basically we're playing with the sort of the same game, but on a very, on a little bit different, uh, in a little bit different environments. And, um, yeah, that's painful, and I think that this, this is going to be solved with the, uh, with the stricter versions and amount of time. Last slide. Basically, what we want to do with the PSD2 API, we want to improve where we and the market see the way to go. First thing, maybe one, one thing is to mention is that we cannot right now make a changes only. Swebank so decided to make this change, and then we see the SCB did it another way. And then again, you will have bank A, B, C, D, F, so what we're doing, we're listening to you, we're bringing it to the bank associations, we're trying to harmonize it and then put it in the new way of doing stuff. And deploying premium APIs, yeah, so I said that what we see, of course, the advantage of the partnerships, and we see that even today, because with the thing that with the Lexeus, we have not been meeting that often before as we're meeting now, because the guys who are using it, seeing some advantages in additional things and uh, because that's what partnership is about. So basically what we see that it's, this is something that uh, we will also harvest some use for us and hopefully for our partners. That's it. Well, our time has sort of run out, but we, I think we can ask a few questions. Uh, so what is your view the best PSD2 API standard on the market, e.g. Berlin Group? I think that all standards are, pff, they're not standards. It can say Berlin Group is like, it's like Scandinavian standard. You can do this way or that way or that way. That's not a standard. If you look at the ISO, that's a standard, which says that you do it that way. So basically I think that it's still very mature, but it's very difficult to implement it like in a very hardcore way because some banks doing international payments, first they're converting money in the account and then, then sending the money. Another are sending the money and they're just converting it as a part of a payment. So they have a different business logic inside. So <laughs> it will be super painful, but I think that uh, there is no good one. I th maybe Open Banking UK is uh, a bit more mature because they had one year more to develop. I cannot say that they're better, but they're just a bit more mature. Okay. Uh, could it be expected banks to extend the scope of services available via API without... Ooh, someone... Regulatory oh. push. Yes. Yeah, uh, I think that it will be rather adjustment of existing services. I don't think it will be extension without regulatory push because, I mean, come on, sleep. Honestly, this is a commercial company. Would you, why would you extend it then give something for free? Okay, now nobody will like me in this audience. But this is true, this is a commercial company. But what makes sense, because sometimes, 
And again, this is another learning from all those open banking events. And there was revelation from several of the TPPs. They said, that, screw this free of charge service because it, was way, it would be way cheaper for us not getting a license, not getting uh, all the certificates, but rather signing a contract with several banks that we want to work with. It would be cheaper instead of spending such, such amount of money on lawyers, on licenses, and later on being compliant and da, da, da. So basically in some cases, it might be better to have a commercial relationship because everything has a price. Once you're in this game, you think it, it's nice, you know, you think, it, you think about it like, again, short-term and long-term relations. When you're uh, sort of, when it's presented PSD2, it's sort of a dating, you know, you can date, you can use API. But actually, once you're getting a license, you're getting married with all the consequences because the divorce will not be that easy and the, and the, the audits will be there. You need to have a compliance officer there, da, 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 da. So sometimes commercial relationships, damn it, it's a bad parallel. Sometimes commercial relationships are not that bad. So this is from my perspective. Okay, and the last question, those questions that are uh, sent in and you want answers, I hope you will spare some time to maybe answer them individually because there's food only for the first 15 people the <laughs> the ones who are late uh, I'm sorry you you'll just have to get some sandwiches somewhere so the last question will current version of your API's will be supported long time or you will create new versions and sunset existing uh, I think that in the coming two years, it will be uh, new version sun sunsetting because the market will be developing fairly quickly. But of course, we will not be doing that. Like It will be still be a reasonable amount of time. It will be three, six months to migrate to the new API. But uh, market, it's very immature. So we will change a lot. And yes, we will not keep five versions in parallel. It's not convenient for you and super expensive for us. And there are still very few players, so it's easier for us to sit down together with Alexeus, with Pesera, with SCB, who is using us, and help them to migrate, rather than keeping five versions um, in parallel. Okay, a round of applause for Oleg. Oh.